On today's podcast, I have a repeat performer, a guy who I like to really talk ball with because we talk about ideas that are outside the box. And we've had those type of coaches here before, of course, with our current guest, but also with a, a guy like Kevin Kelly, who recently made the jump from being a head high school coach to a college head coach at the FCS level. And Coach Thad Wells is joining me today, and he's out also made the jump right now to uh, working at the college level in um, he's going to share, again, some of those ideas I think that really can give you an edge because they are uh, outside the norms of, of how we think about the game, yet very simple to do. So, Thad, it's always great to have you here, and welcome back to the Coach and Coordinator Podcast. Man, Keith, it's, it's, uh, when, whenever I get on here, uh, I literally start pacing like crazy, my heart, right? Like, I just love talking ball, and I do, like, I mean, you know, man, like, I just get passionate. It's just fun, um, and being able to talk to somebody else, um, that also, uh, I guess, appreciates, um, you know, the value that coaches bring to the sport. And then what you do for us is, is amazing. But like you said, from the beginning, it's, um, you know, whenever I talk to somebody or present at a clinic or it, whatever, it's, it's always this thought of, of outside the box. Um, that's usually the thing that comes up. And um, at the end of the day, for me, what I'm always thinking about is simply the same thing that every other coach is thinking about. How do we put our players in the best position to be successful? That's literally before every game. That's a prayer I say. Please just don't, don't let me get in their way. Let us put them in the best position to reach their potential. And then that applies to life as well, not just on game day, but let us help them reach their potential. And that's kind of like where my mind is right now. Uh, you know, we've all had this off season or this time, a lot of time, at least, you know, previous over the last year or so with COVID. And then, like you said, I went from high school to college and my role has changed. So when you're a head coach in high school, like it's just, it's almost, it's almost more freedom right now because in high school, like you have all these things to worry about. You're the, you're the strength coach, you're the nutrition expert, you're everything. So going and being, having a defined role allows your mind to kind of wander a little bit more again. And, and so I've really been going back and thinking about the principles of the game. And, and one thing that just, has really stuck out to me and, and people talk about this this box or creativity in general um, and I've really thought a lot about it um, and the thing that keeps on coming back to me is uh, I've studied a lot of John Boyd over the years a lot of people just think about the OODA loop but uh, it's so deep like what the, the, the knowledge that he brought to the military and then then eventually to conflict and then life in general and he talked about the creative process and the learning process. And I've went down a massive rabbit hole on studying that read tons of books now. Um, and then even got into physics and in which, man, I was not a science guy growing up. I did not do well in high school and college, but my love for the game got me to want to understand the principles more and more. So like right now I'm reading the, the Richard Feynman sets on physics, right? Which is like, why in the world? But, but like, I've read most books on football. Like, it's just like, I got to find something else that continues to get better. Um, but uh, so this box of creativity, what I've kind of found is like, you know, you can't just be outside the box. Uh, one, like it's illegal. And that's, that's kind of what sets the box is the rules of the game. But two, if you're always outside the box, you're not being, you're not necessarily thinking about being effective. Right. So you've got to be effective at and, and I'm always been an offensive minded person. So I'm going to talk in like the, the sense of scoring points, but you're trying to score points with your players and you can't you can't just be creative to be creative. And so it has to be effective. So there is out of doubt a balance between creativity and proven processes, proven systems. And if you want to talk about X's and O's, proven schemes to uh, to attack somebody. But there has to be some creativity in there. Or else, something else that we talk about, anticipation sets in and the the opponent knows who you are and what you're doing and you're not putting your players in the best position to be successful. So that box, so you can imagine, like literally, it's hard to do do talking, but imagine drawing a big box, all right? And this box probably isn't perfectly square. It's probably more of an octagon or something else, but imagine drawing this big box. And to me, the beginning of the box, the biggest box you can draw starts with the rules of the game. So the rules create our parameters. They're the parameters. All these are parameters, but it's the first parameters we must follow as coaches are the rules, right? So everybody's got the same box. We all have the same box starting with the the rules, all right, and how we think about the game. But then the next step to me is our knowledge of the rules. Now, 
you know, at the high school level, I, I just, you know, I, for, I was a weird guy reading the rule book multiple times a year. I just wanted to know my limitations so I could push the boundaries, not in an illegal way, but I wanted to know how far I could go to be creative and put our players in best position to be successful. But if you don't know the rules, either A, you're going to break them and then you are illegal, or B, you're going to be afraid to push them because you don't want to be illegal. So you might not explore an area that could offer an opportunity. All right, so beyond the rules then are the principles, and that's kind of where I'm at right now, really trying to find the principles of the game. So this is about like with physics and understanding space and angles and, and speed and, 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 and then the mental side, but these principles. Um, to one of the biggest principles that I think is the ultimate limiter on all this is time. So if you're creating this box, you're going to, you have the rule book or sorry, the rules create the big box. Then your box is going to start shrinking with all these other parameters you're going to put in place. So your knowledge of the rules, if you don't know that much, it's going to shrink more Then time. Okay. So time comes into two areas, two places where this matters for the players. So at, at the FBS level here, we have X amount of hours. The NCAA says that we can work with our players. So we, we are all on the same, if we're legal, we are all on the same page on how many hours we can improve our players' abilities, and then help them execute on game day. So we're all on the same page. But then there's the coach's time, which isn't regulated. So if we wanted to spend 24 hours a day, we could. We wouldn't survive very long. So, but you know, then you have your, your responsibilities in life, your family, and everything else. So the, you're going to make a conscious decision on how much time you're going to invest, and that is going to, again, shrink your box to, to the, the, the thoughts you're going to come up with, the, princi- the processes you're going to create, and speaking of process, that's like kind of the next thing in my mind is our process. The, the biggest two processes I think about are teaching and communication. If our teaching isn't very good and our communication systems aren't very good, then we're going to limit our players' ability, not physically, but mentally. And I think this is like a, a you know, completely different topic, but I think the game, we've, we've, all, we've pushed this tempo deal, and it's made the game simpler and simpler and simpler to a degree. And – what that's really done, though, in one way, is like we're not using the potential of our the mental ability, our players' ability, uh, to their full potential. Instead, we're just we're making everything simpler, 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 easier, easier. And one way to view that is our teaching methods aren't good enough, or and or our communication methods aren't good enough in deploying our people in in practices and games and everything else. And then probably the biggest uh, parameter on that box and the, the detailing what it looks like is personnel. So you come to your personnel, the players in the game. Yeah, I've, I've seen your thing recently with your, your, I think, six or seven Ps, and personnel is a big thing in that, and, cre- and, and understanding you know your people, and that's your staff too, your coach's staff too, but your, your players on the field, their, their limits, their physical, their mental limits, their moral limits with their, with their motivation. So you start to create this box. All right, and the last thing I would say that maybe is the biggest limiter, and this is why like, people call me outside the box, as for whatever reason, I grew up questioning things, and I just didn't have that kind of like fear set, and I think that is a limiter to a degree, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but social pressures are real, right? If you're a coach at – I don't care what level, but especially like the college level, if you're not successful and you do something outside the box, then it is viewed as the reason why you're not successful, and that might mean you're gone. So it feels a lot easier – to just go with what has worked from others. So that's not an excuse for why you are not doing well. So it's very, and I get that that's real. Right. And you can't, you can't deny that because if you completely go outside the box and you don't consider the social implications, you're not going to be a good recruiter because nobody's going to want to come to your school. If you are per se, like if you're an FBS school and you, and we've seen it recently, like, you know, you switch, switch to the flex phone, like, you know, power five or whatever, that's, that's tough to get the recruits and you see what happens. And then that's, you know, that's happened to not just Flexbone, but, but so many systems and that social pressure. So that's another limiter. So all that says to me is, is that, that, that box is you're trying to keep it as big as you can so you can explore the options that are out there for your players to put them in the best position to be successful. And, and so that's like the beginning to me of creativity, of trying to keep your mind open to look at all options. I mean, we're going through crazy times right now in life definitely in sports and you know it's uh it's the ability to be creative and adapt is absolutely to me paramount right now with our sport and in life in general and that's and and like i get that's to me why i've spent so much time lately trying to understand the very fundamental principles of the game like not i'm not studying anymore 
you know, just air raid or, or the, the three, three, five, whatever, like not just studying schemes, but the actual principles. And, and I was, and I, I know this sounds weird and it's probably not for everybody, but I was literally asking the question to myself over the last couple of years, what is the essence of the game? Like, what does this come down to? And I've worked constantly, like weirdly in trying to write this like perfect paragraph out or these perfect few steps to say, for me, I know everybody attacks the game different. That's what makes it so fun as a coach. Like you don't have to do what everybody else does. So for me, I had to write down the principles of the game. So this is my, my thought right now, as of today, which is, is always evolving. Well, I'm going to pause you the right there because I, I got a couple questions before we head into this one, just stepping backwards. And a couple points that you made, and I think examples that pointed out, like – in this, this whole thing, I think you're 100% correct. Um, there certainly is the safe place to to coach in this game, and it's to go with what has shown to be effective for other people and go and do that. And a lot of people do that, and it works for them. And then, then you get guys who, as you say, think outside the box. And it could be, like I said, a Kevin Kelly. Um, you know, another guy who comes into mind is, is Dub Maddox, who's created – R4 as a way of, of operating his offense and, um, and and really not just operating his offense now, but in game planning. And so for, for him, it's become a whole new process. But I think both of those guys in those examples knew very well what the, the parameters they're working within, right? What are the rules of the game? What are the principles of the game? And in understanding those very well and examining those deeper, maybe that anybody else does, they have become they been able to come up with their answers that have been very successful for them. I know there's there's been people who I, I've seen it even locally at the high school level go out and try to to copy a Kevin Kelly and we're gonna you know we're gonna go for it on every fourth down and and uh, you know again you really need to dig into why those people do it right and and have those deep conversations. You know the best is to have it with that person who created it to really understand everything behind it and what you're going to go through, how you adjust to it, et cetera. Um, but, you know, Kevin Kelly's been able to stay the course and do those things and be successful with it in a way that probably other people could not do. You know, Dub's, Dub created a new way of looking at the passing game with his R4 system and, and putting things together within it, and it continues to evolve. It's been exciting to watch what he's done with that, but it really has created principles behind a system that, he uses so uh, it is that fine line of of you know what you call creativity, but at the same same time really understanding and having uh, those convinc- convictions as well as um, the solutions when run, when problems pop up that you're able to solve that and continue moving forward with where you're at instead of scrapping it and saying yeah I was wrong um, because as, as you mentioned the the easy thing to do is. Um, kind of play it closer to the vest and not take those chances. So that does require a lot of studying. And I know you study the game and it's funny when you talk to, you know, a Kevin Kelly, you talk to a Dub Maddox, you talk to a Dan Gonzalez, those guys read widely, read outside the game, read other things, read business, science, military, uh, to understand more, um, just uh, about the competitive side of things, how things are organized, what strategy looks like, philosophy, et cetera. So, um, you know, in, in the time we've talked, and you and I have had a lot of conversations off the phone, that's, that's been something that's been driving you. But also, and, you know, I think we could get into this uh, a, a little bit later because I know you wanted to share some, some things you put together, but um, the way you've viewed things, you've made a calculated I would call it a risk right now, right? There's a lot of people, I see it all the time on Twitter. I hear people ask me. I hear people ask coaches in our clinics, how do you become a, a college coach? How do I get to the next level? And and truthfully, if you really want to get there, you're going to have to make some incredible sacrifices. You're going to have to be willing to take chances. And and a lot of people just aren't in a position to do that. Not, not necessarily that you were either, but you've said, you know what, we're going to do it. We're going to take a risk. So we're going to get into a little bit of, of your journey and where you are right now. Um, but let's let's pause on that idea and go to where you were um, with, you know, what you've put together here and the way you've thought about this and your principles. It's the perfect segue because, like you mentioned, three people that I did spend quite a bit of time earlier on studying between Gonzalez. I, I read his books. And the things that he put out several years, I mean, when I was first getting in, 
I was reading his stuff. Um, and then the R4 stuff was one of the first things I went to to understand quarterback play after college. I studied the R4 system with Doug Max and all the things, had his books, uh, DVDs, understanding how to teach quarterback mechanics. It was one of the first things I went to because it was a system that, you know, trying to systemize that process, and that helped me. And then with uh, Coach Kelly, I went, went to a, uh, uh, a convention in Atlantic City, got to meet him, and started studying that. And then that next season, you know, it was my second year as a head football coach. I was like, all right, we're going all in on Coach Kelly's stuff. Like, we're going to be onside kicking, but all this stuff. And to start to see, and I'm not saying, like, his stuff works 100%. But here's the, the analogy or thought that I'm going with. We were two and four in that season. We were two and four, second year as a head coach. And I just had a, an epiphany for whatever reason. I was reading a book, and it basically just told me, sad, like, you've put in a ton of work to understand. And I was still young and, like, still trying to understand, but, like, You've got to be you. Like, you're not Coach Kelly. And, like, you learn from these people. But, and this goes back to the first principle of thinking, there's this analogy between a chef and a cook. All right? So a chef understands the principles of cooking. They create. They create their recipes with ingredients. I'm standing here right now in my kitchen looking at a, a book called The Flavor Bible, which tells you the profiles of flavor. I love to cook, by the way. The profiles of, of different foods and what they go with. If you understand those principles, you can make any kind of dish. But a cook just follows a recipe, and if, and if something's going wrong, the cook doesn't really understand how to fix it because they didn't create it. And so that's what, like, this epiphany, we're two and four. It's like, man, I got to do my thing the way I see it. We ended up, like, you know, going undefeated, winning the state title. It was just that, that aha. That literally was, I would say, without a doubt, that week when we were two and four, that aha moment of saying, trust yourself. Go with your gut on this. And then we won that state title the next day. I've said this before on here. I woke up and said, man, there's got to be more than just studying the game. So I, I went past, like I said, like these other guys reading books. I've read like 500 books now on everything. And, but it always comes back to I want to apply it to the game. And, so, and I want to know the essence so I can be my version of a chef versus a cook. And that's where this, this like paragraph came from. Is, and, and so in order – the essence so that I can create and adapt. So we can create what we need and adapt to the, the, the when we need to change it up because it's not working. All right, so I ask this question simply. How do you win games, right? Sounds simple, right? But how do you win games? Now, I'm going to say this from an offensive perspective, but you could flip this to a defensive perspective very easily. But I'm going to go from an offensive side. All right, to win games, you must score more points than your opponent. <laughs> very simple. To win a game, you must score at least one more point than your opponent. So then you say, well, how do you score points, right? To score points, you must first gain possession of the football. You, Unless it's a safety, which you're not going to win that many games if all you do is score safeties, right? So you must have possession. So on defense, get the ball. On offense, keep the ball. You can't score touchdowns. And I don't care about field goals and safety. You can't score touchdowns without the football, all right? So then once you have the football, you must maintain possession until you do score. So you must hold on to it, which lends to – to maintain possession and score, you must penetrate the defense with efficient and or explosive plays, which that's kind of – that really encompasses a lot of things. We talk about turnover statistics. We talk about efficiency and explosiveness. But moving the football, is, according to the down the distance, is what efficiency is. And what all an explosive play does is reduce how efficient you need to be. Because of human nature, and this is studying psychology and just human nature in general, because of human nature, it is very hard to be efficient. To, to methodically move the football. The, 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 the armies and navies and all those guys, they have a different system and their different makeup of what they're trying to do in the world. And they have a whole re regime that helps them with that. It is very hard to be a efficient with no explosiveness. So every time you get an explosive play, that's less efficiency you need. All right, so we're trying to move the ball, penetrate the defense with efficient explosive plays. And then to penetrate the defense, you must win space. That's, and that's where I stopped maybe like six months ago. I just kept on thinking about nothing but space. And man, we've got to win space. That's what this game is about. And you've heard like a ton of coaches will, will talk like that. But okay, we've got to win space. And then I started reading more and more of John Boyd and understanding his, his approach to, to warfare and everything else. And then kind of like, like started keeping on going. I said, okay, to win space, all right? So how do you win space? You win it by matching 11 individual players one play at a time. That's an offensive coordinator's job is to mesh the, the, the physical abilities, the mental abilities, right, of 11 players one play at a time to win space. 
And ultimately, those plays add up on top of each other, but it's one play at a time. Execution does matter. It's not just about creativity and whatever. You've got to execute, right, to, to, to win these individual plays with 11 individual players. You know, every play is a new – you can have new personnel, but 11 at a time, one play at a time. All right, then it got to this next level of thinking with, with Boyd and everything else. This is all done by increasing and deploying our people's energy. And I know, like, the word energy, I don't know, like, if you just use the word potential, I think, like, football guys would be like, okay, yeah, I get it. But, like, it's, it really it's, – it comes down to, to energy, which, again, I know it sounds a little different, but you're essentially trying to increase your potential energy overall and then increase your decision-making. Those are the two big deals. And that's really the essence of life. Like, and that's kind of what Boyd reached and, and some of these other philosophers and things I'm looking at is just that you, you have to increase your energy. Like literally, like you, you get good sleep, you have good nutrition, you exercise, you increase your strength, like specifically on the football field, you increase your speed. So your, your potential, and you increase your potential in recruiting, right, development. But then you have to deploy that potential in a way that meshes 11 people together. So it all came down to the essence of, to me, between really life and the game of football is being able to increase your potential energy and deploy it with the proper decisions. And that to me, this thought of energy in general became that fundamental principle. And like Boyd would talk about the three things that really matter in, in conflict in life. And like he talked about war, but he went way beyond that in conflict in life was physical, mental and moral energy. So the physical is what we all think about. Like I just said, the mental is being able to, um, make good decisions. And then he included moral, which, it, you know, with, with 3D Coach, you know, their whole platform and everything, that moral is kind of the, the spiritual or the heart. But he really, he defined it as kind of morale as well. So like morality in the sense of like believing in what you're doing. So like, that's kind of like the X factor to me. If you believe what you're doing, if you have good morals and good morality and you have high morale, you're going to get more physical or more physical potential, and you're going to do better with your mind. So those three things all work together. And so, but, so then I start to think, okay, if this is kind of the principle, uh, like this understanding this, this potential energy and try to build it and release it, essentially, then we have to understand that there are a lot more physical limitations than there are mental and moral limitations. So, for example, like the 40 time, right? Like that's a physical thing we check for in football, broad jump, everything else. And we can 100%, we can improve that. But I would, I would, in my mind, I do believe that we have really become very efficient at the physical side of the game, especially as the higher up you go. Like in the NFL, it's like, you know, the premium in terms of like efficiency at reaching your physical potential, right? And so like the youth levels will be the least because you're not spending as much time on it, right? But we're really reaching that physical, very, very, very efficient on the physical side, right? The one limiting factor that none of us can argue is that time. So time is that ultimate limiter in trying to reach your potential, right? But the, the, the mental and moral compliance, I, I just believe that our mental limitations are, are really unknown. There's a lot of theories. There's a lot, like we, me and my, my best friend, we read books on um, like the, the, uh, the brain and trying to understand the mental limitations there on learning and, and communication and all those things. But we really believe like the limitations are a lot less on that mental side, right? So, the, what, the thing that I've started to think about more and more is don't let your mind be the limiting factor. Time is a limiting factor. Your physical body is a limiting factor, which you can increase by, you know, with training and, and recruiting and all that. But don't let your mental capacity be the limiting factor. Like have good systems is what that really is, is getting to. And then if, if energy is a fundamental principle, all right, then I start to think about anticipation as the principle, so the word anticipation, like it's to me, it's huge in the game of football. But the, this principle of anticipation is what allows us to be uh, to effectively deploy that energy, to make good decisions, to try to anticipate what is happening. We we expect. You can think of like a goalie, right? Like if a goalie in soccer, like it's a 50-50 deal right there. But can they pick up tails from each striker or or you know in a penalty shot? Do they have some kind of knowledge, some kind of thoughts beforehand? That will help them anticipate instead of being a 50 50 game it's at least a 51 49 deal in that situation so that anticipation you're trying to create and so boyd talked about he started he was a uh, uh um uh he, he flew uh planes right he was a fighter pilot and he first started studying the potential energy of a plane and man i'm telling you this is i've talked to a sports scientist at another university and 
and uh, so, uh, somebody I graduated with in college and, and like I br- presented this formula to him from Boyd and, and like it, we've talked a lot about it since, but essentially Boyd created this formula that said, you know what, like, and this was like a 50s, 60s, 70s, that era, you know what, an airplane's biggest feature is not velocity like everybody they wanted the fastest plane they said we got to have the fastest plane this is probably going to sound pretty familiar in football right now we wanted the fastest planes we thought that would be the most important thing so boyd you know he was actually flying the planes and he was telling congress and everybody like listen that's not the best like that's not it he said there's something else so he went on this long path researching and came up with a formula that basically came up with potential energy meaning it's not just how fast you go it's your ability to change direction and maintain that speed, which kind of starts, you know, could get to like quickness. So he started talking about deceleration with acceleration. Um, so, so, but what he was really defining was the physical limitations of a plane. Mm-hmm. And then he came up with the OODA loop. The OODA loop was the mental process of the person flying the plane. So you apply this to a physical, an athlete on the field. So their physical body has this potential energy that they're trying to put out there. Right. But it's their mind that is all, the ultimate limiter. Like they can work on their body all off season, all the whole, like forever and get it in best shape. But their mind helps them make decisions. And so that OODA loop, which was observe, orient, decide and act, was a way to train pilots to use their potential, to use their energy. And so you now talk, bring that into football. All right. So think about a defense. So a defense, every play. So I'm offensive minded, you know, thinking about how to attack an offense. So a defense has to go through a process. So does the offense. But the defensive process, they're essentially trying to observe what's going on, trying to get oriented based off their play call and what you presented them. Then they've got to make a decision or at least a reaction and, like, act and do these things. So you start thinking, like, okay, that's the and, – and Boyd would talk about how do you get inside of somebody's loop. How do you have a, 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 a smaller circle and you can operate faster? And how can you break the processes of your opponent? And so if you look at that process of the defense, all right, this is where we started. So now I'm going to try to take it to the, a specific example of something on the field. So in 2000, it's like 17, um, we, were, we were getting ready for a playoff, the playoffs, and we, did, we weren't playing a great team. So, you know, we were like, how can we add a little bit more chaos so the playoff teams have to prepare for this stuff? And so we started playing with this thing, which I'll call it our PETA package right now, which PETA, pain in the butt, you know, that's – we were just trying to be a pain in the butt. We were simply – trying to steal time from the opponent to create an imbalance between how much time we focus on our real stuff, but they would have to work on other stuff. So this PETA package deal, it started off with simply giving three rules. All right. So three rules to start off how this would work. And those three rules were essentially the center. All right. So you can imagine coming up to the line of scrimmage, all right, you, you were, you were, you can either break a sugar huddle or you could just do this as soon as you're tackled. You go into this PETA mode. We called it tornado at our last school because we were the tornadoes and it was chaos. So we just said tornado, and we would get straight into this. And essentially, the center would get on the ball, and then what, whoever we wanted to take a direct snap, whether the quarterback, if it's an athlete or just an athlete, would get behind them. And then everybody else lined up wherever they wanted to as long as we had enough people on the ball. And, and there were times where we just said, everybody go on the ball so there's no confusion. We don't care. But we try to teach them, like, yeah, you know, you're usually off, stay off, you're on, stay on. All right, so very simple. And then all we told the, the person catching the snap, the quarterback or whoever, don't lose a yard. All right, and I know this sounds like, okay, well, what's the point of all this? Well, it was a self-adjusting formation system that allowed us to be in a million different formations. That didn't, we didn't care what formation we were in. They were cre- cre- different. Like all defenses, they're processes. All defenses are made up of rules. So to get a line, they have a system of rules that t- says line up to this formation. Well, if you break those rules, because you can't remember a million rules, if you break those rules and present them something different, then they've got to adjust somehow. So they've got to create a new set of rules to adjust to your, your, your chaos. And so we just wanted to present something for them to line up in and have to deal with that. So we would, hey, we're like, hey, man, let's do this like twice a game, and then they'll always have to at least prepare for it. And maybe they'll have to spend 10 minutes, and, and once we install it, we literally practice we, five minutes to install it. And then we literally ran it in practice one time a day in team session. We would just go to it, run it, be done. And all we told them is, like, do not lose a yard. Don't, don't catch a snap and start running backwards. Like, literally just get back to the line of scrimmage if that's all you can do. But we told the, the, the guys lining up, we said, hey, just block the most dangerous man. This was, like, when we first put it in. Just block the most dangerous man. Hey, quarterback, athlete, just run the grass. Don't lose a yard. Run the grass. The first time we ran it, it was like a 69-yard touchdown. 
And we yeah, were just dying laughing on the yeah. side. <laughs> we were just dying laughing. We didn't know what the players were going to do. I will say the first time we practiced this, every school I've been to, and we've done this now, like linemen want to have fun. They'll go line up and face the wrong direction. Yeah. And just like, all right, guys, listen, we, we have a few parameters here. Like, don't be silly. But, you know, it is fun for them. So that's what it started off as. It's just this simple, we're going to steal time. But then we started scoring touchdowns on it. And, and like, not always, but we had a lot of big runs because we started to get a lot of space for them. Now, if that's all you did, right, eventually somebody's going to be like, listen, they don't throw the ball over there to the people standing there. Like, just put everybody right there and go tackle that athlete. So over time, we developed a few more rules, and this started to become a real package um, with time. Stop you for a second. I love (laughs) the idea of how simple you made this. And, you know, I did go through your course on, on CoachTube, and, and we'll share the link to that here in the, the show notes. Highly recommend it. In fact, the, the free or the basic package that Coach is talking about is free there where he takes you through step-by-step step of exactly how they did it. But what I liked about it most was that it took – you know what you wanted. You wanted your guy in space with the ball. Your number one rule was don't lose a yard, but you weren't necessarily looking to, to gain big yards. Now, when it goes in and hits for you know 60-some-yard touchdown on the first time you run it, now people, you really got their attention. But I, I like the idea of being able to get something on, on film. And we've had those, those games before, high school level, college level, where I've, I've looked at it and said, you know, I, I feel very confident about this game. I think, you know, we could put this package in. I don't know how good it will get for us, but I do want to get it on film and test some things and, and maybe we'll go forward with it or not. But the thing is, somebody's got to prepare for it. And the idea too, like, you can extend this. I had a, a conversation with a, a former player of mine who's who's a OC now at the Division II level and was finalizing his playbook, and we got to talking about shifts and motions, and I reminded him why you know, we put one of our procedures in, which we called bounce. You know, we had like 20 tempo tools that we would use, not all in one game. We would game plan them. Um, but one of our favorites was one we just called bounce, and bounce was our, guys, we're going to shift, and here are your rules. You know, I, I don't want you to shift from a two by two to a, a two by two. I want you to change strength. I want you to change gaps. I want you to change how the defense is going to have to leverage us. And, and you guys need to move quickly. But I don't care where you line up. We have to have a legal shift. So if if you're on and somebody um, you know moves outside you, you, you know you need to move off, etc. You guys communicate it with each other. You make it work. And you know what I found when you do something even simple like that. Right, and that's something we have within an up tempo offense. Coaches all ask all the time, "How do I get shifts and motions in?" Well, I'd say the simple way is let your guys do it, because if it's another thing in your thought process, you have to add, especially if you're going fast. Boy, it's gonna, it's you're either not gonna do it, or it's gonna slow you down. So for me, it was just that one word bounce, which we would always call our tempo first bounce, and then we'd go ahead and give the play. So bounce was it within the signals. Our guys loved it. They would line up and you know, some crazy things every now and then I'd have to, you know, tell certain guys like no one will ever believe that you are the tight end. Like you are not allowed to line up there again. But, you know, other than a few things here or there, like your guys being backwards, it, it took the thought process out of it. And now I know what do you, what do you know about a defense? They're charting everything you start in, right? They are charting every single formation you, you start in just in case there's some kind of trend that develops there. Well, my guys are are doing things that maybe I'm not even thinking about. I wouldn't have put them in that set, et cetera. But guess what? It, it shows up now in a breakdown. And that was the important thing. So we utilize something like that, those rules, for just something simple like a shift. But you've taken it and added it to a package. And, you know, I was also thinking back to just, again, outside the box and competing because that's what you said. This is about putting our guys in the best position to win. And so share a quick story here. Um, I think it was my my second year as a head coach, and I was at a small school. I want to say the school we were playing was somewhere from one and a half to two times bigger than us as far as enrollment, and they were two platoon. Um, this was the at the beginning of they were like one of the first teams, if not the first team in our area, to be spread, no huddle, right? Everybody has been huddling and lining up in like pro I and wing T and stuff like that, and they can move. They can move fast. And I've got like, I don't know, 16 guys who, who uh, play both sides of the ball. And I was like, man, these guys are going to have us gassed. 
by the second quarter, we got to do something different. We have to get our guys off the field. But how do I do that, right? If I, I mean, I can't. I didn't have depth. If I put one of these other guys in, we were like a freshman who couldn't block a soul. Well, we got that freshman into the game. We went to, and I know you mentioned it in your course, but we went to the Lonesome Polecat. And we took those guys and we threw them all the way out on the side. And we took our best guys and we put them in a position where they were still going to get the ball. And we played. They still have to go over there and defend, right? So we played like <laughs> five on five football on the other, you know, three quarters of the field. And we had guys out there who were absolutely no threat to block anybody, catch a pass, do anything <laughs> with the football, but they had to defend them with their guys. And so our plan that game in order to be competitive and keep keep ourselves in a game and be in a position, you know, to, to win in the fourth quarter every six minutes, those guys were going into the game. And they were going to go in, you know, for a series. And, and, you know, they actually picked up a couple first downs in it. But that would, the objective was take some time off the clock, get our guys a break, keep them fresh so we could win in the fourth quarter. And we ended up going into a double overtime game and, and losing. It was one where I contemplated late in the game. It was tied doing the, the fair, uh, fair catch for a free kick. And, and um, you know, I got talked out of it because of the distance. But, um, but I could say that strategy put us in position to – uh, to be able to compete and, and be there right at the end. Obviously, we didn't come through, but that was some outside-the-box thinking in order to do those things. Uh, the, the thing that comes to my mind when you're talking about all those things, the way I've started to classify, for me, I started to classify our plays into a static play, into a dynamic play. And so where you, where you talked about like giving players some autonomy and, and allowing them to make some decisions, that starts to create this dynamic feature to a play where, you, like you said, you remove your thoughts, your, your, a process, you make mm-hmm. the process simpler for you as a coach. And now you have this, this autonomy to create, which adds like a dimension of multiplicity to that, to the play. And every time you call it, it's different. So you're adding to, you're no adding to you, right? It's, it's not harder for you. It's not harder for the players. But the thing that comes to my mind right here, and this is another thing that Boyd, Boyd basically said, to do all these things, if you want to be, you know, to, to, to win in, in, the, in, in this kind of way, to, to have some autonomy within it, you have to have mutual trust. And I just finished reading the book, uh, Evolution of the Game. Like, it, you're just going through the history of, the, of football with the rules and, and all that. And, and, you know, before, there used to be not stoppage of play, right? It was much more like rugby and soccer. And then they started stopping. The, and, and you basically had, like, the quarterbacks call the play. They weren't, were like – play callers on the sideline the, the, the not even quarterbacks like they're playing on the field to call the play and then they introduced the stoppage of play and plays and in my opinion that's when ego started to come in a little bit more and that stoppage started to say we need to create more strategy and, and you know ego is just part of life but like it's it's for whatever reason like people started to lose trust in young people and i get it because a coach spends all the time thinking about it and maybe a young person doesn't but that goes back to the communication and your ability to teach, to put that on them, to allow them that tr- to, to build that trust so that they can create those things. And that's where like this whole like little PETA package deal, like we started to see like, man, the, the players are doing like some neat stuff with this and we're not giving them any direction. And so like, then we ran into that problem of like, listen, like, well, we saw the problem coming. If we never throw the ball out of this at all, like they're just going to send people off the edge at our center and we're done. So we have to add a few more rules to it. And, and so within that, we, we started to do some more stuff to add it to it. And we started to, I started to create a PETA coordinator position. <laughs> all right. So essentially like this person now, now think, and so this is what we stumbled upon. And like, I'm not going to get emotional right now. Like this dude that helped me build this and like came with, like moved with me from Virginia to North Carolina was coming to a game this past year. He passed away in a car wreck coming to a game, yeah. but this was my dude. Mm-hmm. All right, and I might get a little emotional, but this was my guy that helped me build this thing, and he was my PETA coordinator. All right, so basically what we started doing. Now, I want you to, like, now I'm very passionate about this, and I think there is some legitimacy to this thought. Okay, so we started messing with this and messing with this. We started testing this at the JV level first and then started doing it at varsity. So that's always been our kind of testing ground. And then uh, basically if you think about that process, you go back to the OODA loop, you go back to the defensive process. So every play, when the play is dead, they look over to the sideline to get the play call. Somebody on at least one person has to, if not the entire team, for signals. All right. So what we started thinking is, what if, what if you use this as a tempo? 
Like you can use it, yeah. you know, the entire game or just whenever you want. So what if this was a tempo, this kind of PETA stuff, or this automatic formationing, just go with this freedom. We included some more rules. We started creating pods on the field. We basically created like a field pod, a boundary pod, the box, and some other stuff with it. And this is kind of like the advanced, like, I guess, version of, of this PETA stuff. But what we thought was like, if, we, if the ball is dead and they're looking for a play, what if they weren't? What if they had to change their communication pattern? Because as soon as the play was dead, our players sprinted into this chaotic formation, and they were ready to snap the football at any time. But I, like, if I, you know, I was a head coach and offense coordinator. I was trying to find the play I wanted, right? If we weren't into like super fast tempo mode, right? But our players were immediately getting into. So the way I think about this is like a live sugar huddle where a sugar huddle allows the, the defense to kind of, you know, take some time, but then you burst into something. Yeah. Well, now we're using a live dynamic quote unquote huddle where the players line up and we can snap the ball and just take off. We can throw quick screens out of it. We can throw some one-on-one routes down the field and we can run some quarterback run game out of it. And so it's just completely, and I don't even know what formation's coming, but as soon as you're tackled, you go line up, the defense has to check. They've got to get a line. They've got to get the numbers right. Right? They basically have to play man coverage across the board to get the numbers right and line up. And then you have your PETA coordinator, who, who my guy was up top. All right? so, so Brad was up top, and he could look down and tell me. Like, if, if I was calling a play as an offense coordinator and I had a signaler right, separate from myself, and he was, the signaler was listening to me and to Brad, the PETA coordinator. And if, if, if the PETA was live and we could run it, then Brad had the, the, the ability to say field box boundary. Like, he could just screen that out. And the signal would just signal it, and we just went with it it's, because it's, they didn't have a number. To, right. uh, it's back to Tiger Ellison's uh, heaven, yes. heaven yep. hell in Boston, right? Red, white, and blue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Areas of the field. Yep. <laughs> so, so like we started going like so like I gave him that freedom. So this is going back to mutual trust. I trust my coaches. I trust my players. You know, we even had our quarterback able to do this at times, depending on the quarterback year to year. But so. If that's going on, and I, it gives me more time, if I want to have more time, to call the better play, to find the better play, while the defense can't relax. And then we, our communication system was set up to where I would call the play. Players could burst into that formation from that P to formation, burst into it, snap the ball. So at what point – now, I'm not saying it's, it's impossible, obviously, but at what point does the defense get their play call in? So if they put their play call in at first, then they've got to remember that whole deal the whole time that chaos is going on. But in the PETA stuff, if they wait till the end, then they've got to get the play call in, recognize a new formation, and think about how to this whole UDA deal before the ball snaps. Yeah, it's like not a perfect deal, but no. it's just, it, it's just you know, it's 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 not just uh, to me. It really w- could be a different tempo entirely to the game to trying to create like a this dynamic huddle sugar type deal to cause a little more chaos. But like you know, we've talked about this. It's just creating that imbalance of that anticipation and stealing time from the defense because what they now have to do is worry about their processes their their main processes that they live with every day they're not just focusing on our schemes so we may be spending 95 percent of our time or more on our offensive schemes in practice once we install this 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 you know this huddle of this this package but then now they can can they only spend five percent of their time getting ready for that because if they don't, we're just going to run the simplest thing that takes advantage of numbers, which is a fundamental principle of the game, and then attack them with it. So, you know, I, like you said, like, you know, I'm at, you know, University of Virginia now. I, I don't get to run this stuff. I'm not, you know, I'm just a, a peon again and just trying to, to, <laughs> to have some fun with this. But it's, um, it's, uh, it's fun to think about it again. I've got some buddies now that are, that are running this in different states that are just, you know, adding it to their package. You know, it's very hard to sell out. You could sell out to it. It's, in a way, it's just a legal A11 stuff in a, in a way yeah. um, without getting to the ineligible numbers and all that. But it adds that autonomy in there for unlimited formations, unlimited chaos. Um, and it's just who I am. And, and it's fun to Fun, fun to for play the kids with. too, definitely. Well, exactly. Be, before we wrap up here, um, we mentioned just talking about you know, and you've alluded to where you've been now and, and made that move from the high school level to working at UVA, now at Virginia. And um, I guess things you're seeing along the way. Um, and I guess the, the thought process behind making the sacrifice, as I said, a lot of guys ask, you know, at coaching clinics or, or on Twitter is like, you know, how do you make it to the next level? And you've been determined since I've, I've known you that I'm just going to get here. 
even if it means I'm volunteering. And so essentially that's what you've done. So talk to us about, you know, what, what was the, the leap of faith? What was that moment or, you know, just where you see things going for you right now? Well, to, to begin with, without a doubt, I have the most amazing wife in the world. All right. So without her, like, you know, with her mindset and us being on the same page, like this is impossible. But like you said, um, so a few years back, I got to do the ASCA 35 under 35 thing. And, uh, you know, I really wasn't, wasn't really thinking about college as much um, at that time. I, I got an offer to be an offensive coordinator at the D3 level and decided to not do it at that time, um, which the person that took it ended up is now the quarterback coach at, um, uh, where's he? He's at the Iowa State. So uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, turned that down uh, and then um, – won a state title, did the AFCA deal and started to build some relationships and just see what that life was like. And basically just came to the conclusion that, you know, I loved coaching in high school. I loved working with, with the kids, but I love working on football. And when, and every high school coach knows this, how important it is for all the other things between your teaching responsibilities, between your duties, right? Between raising or fundraising and, and nutrition and weightlifting and everything else. And, and, and I just – I love life and I love the game of football. I mean, it is my obsession. I just love studying it, loving applying it. And I wanted to make my living and my time in this world with the game of football and not, not necessarily all this other stuff. I wanted to be within football, and I want to be around a lot of people that, that love going to work every day. And, you know, the, the education system is tough right now, without a doubt. I yeah. feel for all of them. I, I praise all of them that there is some tough times. And it's very hard to be, be upbeat and motivated. And I just want to be around, you know, the people that love their job. And so, yeah, you know, you, and we've talked and, and I've tried to, you know, I've, I've had some opportunities. They didn't always, they didn't work out. And about four years ago or so, I, I had a couple guys that were um, going to the university of Virginia and just like uh, visiting. And, and I just happened to actually before that, I read an ESPN article about just right randomly that talked about Coach Mendenhall and his, his habit of reading. And when he became the head coach of BYU, he was introduced to um, someone that suggested him, and maybe he did this on the own. I think the story goes he was introduced to somebody that started talking to him about reading and, and the importance it could help him with some things. And he just got into this and, and more and more. And, like, I didn't know that many coaches that really read widely in business and CEO stuff and all that. And, and I read that article. I was like, man, I've got to meet him. And, you know, I was in Virginia at the time, uh, about four hours away, and, and just wanted to go meet him. And so, um, fortunately, like I said, we had a couple of recruits. Uh, I was able to get to talk to him. And then just slowly over the last several years, he's be, he was my mentor. Um, and I would just, you know, I didn't try to, to bug him. Uh, every six months or so, I'd send him a text and ask him for another book to read. And, and he would oblige. And, and basically, I just realized, like, listen, you know, and, and, I've, and I've learned this from reading books and seeing other people's journeys that if you want to do something, you can't, it's so hard to do it and have money attached to it. If you say, I need, a, I need money, I need a salary, I've got to have this, then it's going to be very hard to go from, you know, to make a pretty big leap, you know, to go from high school to, to power five or whatever. I knew that money was going to be, I had to take it out of the equation. And I haven't really taken it out of the equation, but I basically, you know, went to Coach Mendenhall and said, listen, like I will, I will do anything. I will scrub toilets. I don't care. I just want to get to that level. Um, if it, 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 you may not have anything, but if you know anybody, and then one thing led to the other, and just getting able to and and like you think about this, if if you can do this, now we're literally, you know, my wife and I, we have four kids, six, four, two, and six months, so it's not easy uh, trying to find a place to even. Sort of financially my wife stays at home and homeschools our kids she does some photography but we literally have like no money man like we're just it is faith and belief in this this journey that it's going to work out and what's neat about it is like if if you can somehow bring understand the risk and you can be okay with it if you don't need money you can go at this anyway who doesn't want a, somebody that will work hard for nothing right? right so like you can pick where you want to go you can i wanted to be at the university of virginia Right. I mean, that was a goal I've had for four years now, and it, I wanted to be here because of how the staff approached life. Like I could, if you want to volunteer, you can go volunteer anywhere in the country just about. But I knew that, that Coach Mendenhall and their staff approached the game and life the way that I had to. I couldn't lose my family. 
like like this staff cares about their family. It is family first, last, and always. And I had to be around somebody that valued family. And so I, I just no money, just got to make it as long as I can. And and we're here. And, and being on this like a part of that, I'm just a, a fly on the wall trying to trying to add value where I can and and uh, learn from those guys. But they're amazing humans that um, I just you know wanted to be a walk on. That's how I see myself right now. I'm a walk on with a thankful opportunity to, to show up. And, and if I got to get beat up a little bit and, and do whatever, that's just how it is. Well, coach, I appreciate you taking the time. I love what you've been doing with your journey. I always love talking ball with you and sharing some of those thoughts. And I think a great one here for coaches as they head into the season, something easy you guys can do to steal time from the opponent defensive staff. Uh, for you guys who want to learn more about this, uh, link to this is in the show notes. It's on coach tube. Uh, The first half of it, the basic package, Coach put up there as free. The advanced package is there as well, and he's discounted it to uh, 50% off right now. Um, So go out there, support him, man. He's living the dream too. And Coach, best of luck to you and the Cavaliers here in 2021. Uh, uh, Keith, as always, I appreciate it, man. I love what what this platform does. And uh, always always listening, always following, always trying to learn from you and, and, and your guys. We talked about Coach's PETA package. The link to that is in the show notes. Be sure to check for that. It's an outstanding course, and I think something, again, that goes along with all the things we talked about here today and can give you the visuals that will help you install something like that and help your team keep an edge. Follow all we're doing this season on coachandcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.